Like she said, uh, my name's Taylor Grusing. I work in the Mitchell Regional Extension Office, but I'm actually from Chamberlain. So I drive about an hour east every day. So coming up here was only about two and a half hours. But um, it's a lot, a lot of time on the road, but it kind of let me see um, the country, even though it's from the interstate every day. Um, grew up on a cow-calf operation in Kimball. Um, went to SDSU, Iowa State for some education, and then came back here um, to Chamberlain. My husband's a veterinarian in Chamberlain um, at an associate vet clinic there. Um, so we do the dirty jobs on the weekend, I guess, work cows and everything, and then go to town every day. So I'm really glad Doug talked first because he did my pretty much whole presentation um, and he went long, so now I can go short, right? <laughs> so if we have questions, I'll probably go through this pretty fast. It'll be a little bit of review of what Doug said, and then if we have questions, you can sure come up. Um, and answer questions to all of us because I'm going to defer to him. I love uh, doing the research, you know, in the field from SDSU, but we always know we need the boots on the ground people to show you what really works, right? Um, so everything in the book we know isn't practical. So we really like to kind of cross paths whenever we can. Um, this is nothing new to any of you. Um, since 2012 or su since 2002, we've lost 22% of our croppable pasture land in South Dakota. Right, crop prices went way high. Um, a lot of it was converted into crop grounds and none if any or little if any is being converted back into pasture land today, even though crop prices aren't getting any better. Um, so a continual struggle that we're gonna be dealing with, um, especially with bringing next generations back to the operation, trying to increase maybe our herd size instead of maybe finding more pasture acres to do that on, we're gonna have to maybe get smaller cows like Doug mentioned to get more live calves in the pen at weaning time. Um, grazing fees on that pasture land that we do have available is go are going up, hopefully not this year. Um, we do a land survey every year at SDSU um, and last year I think crop ground started to go down but pasture land stayed about the same. So we need to be able to keep more cattle on those grazing acres that keep it productive in order to be profitable. Um, we just talked a little bit about the drought. I pulled this up um, the other day. Um, this is our projection into April. Um, I went to grazing school a couple years ago and tried to keep in contact with some of the Grasslands Coalition folks. Um, and a lot of them have these grazing plans. And if so, if they don't get rain by March 1st or April 1st, they're already on to step two of their grazing plan. So they're either cutting the number of cows from their herd, um, they're not gonna go to certain pastures, potentially, they're already making those decisions by April. Um, so the dark, the brown um, is a drought persisting. So you can see kind of that cutting across central South Dakota, right where we are, it's gonna persist, but maybe not get worse. Um, the light, the tan, a um, little bit more in that northwestern side of South Dakota, eastern South Dakota, equal chances. So don't know if it's going to get better, don't know if it's going to get worse, but for now I think utilizing the programs that Kay just talked about, uh, prepare yourself, whether start buying hay now, try to source those things before May when everyone else is going to be looking for those options too. This is the inventory of hay stocks as of December. Um, from 2017, we were down about 10% in our hay stocks for the year. So if you are looking for hay, everyone else is too. So um, hay prices went up quite a bit in South Dakota. Now over in Iowa um, or in some of the other states, maybe not so much. Um, but we, you know, $120 hay by the time you get trucking onto that. Um, and it's maybe not even the best quality hay out there. Um, so it's going to be a little bit, um, hey, it didn't go down maybe as much as we thought it would because uh, we did catch some of those late rains, um, but just something to be thinking about in addition to our pasture grounds, uh, what we're going to supplement to our cows once we take them off of the pasture. So our goal every year is we're giving uh, X amount of forage, especially in our pastures that we started talking about today. Um, we're utilizing that to efficiently graze our cattle, hopefully 365 days a year, right? up in the upper Midwest, that always doesn't happen, right? Um, and so the more time we can keep our cattle grazing, um, no matter what it is, the more profitable we're probably going to be. Um, so if we don't have pasture land, um, or if we're, our pasture's dry, last time I was up here, unfortunately, was in June for the drought meeting. Um, I tested a lot of um, spring wheat for nitrates, um, a lot of waters um, for testing too. Luckily, you guys actually were pretty good. Um, I sent a couple samples off 
um, for nitrates and all that spring wheat came back pretty good. Um, and I think you guys did a good job of harvesting that early enough. Um, so it did make some good quality hay for you. Um, most of the dugouts and the waters that I tested were pretty good at that time. I know late June you got a little bit more rain, but you eventually got better. But unfortunately, that's what I was doing up here for you guys in June. Um, so our pastures are really dry at that time. Um, we were starting to look for options. I visited with a couple of folks about grazing pea, or excuse me, soybeans up here. Um, you know, what options that would be for the cattle. Um, just kind of like anything with grazing corn, limiting is going to be your best friend. Um, so some of those, um, you can, they probably provide good nutrients, um, but too much of anything is a bad thing in terms of that. So those are some options we talked about. Um, but in order to make um, better use of our crop ground, uh, potentially last year and maybe going into this year, is to make cattle our crop going forward. Um, so if we can turn, uh, if we know the crop inputs are going to be high, um, if we know the prices aren't maybe going to be quite there, how can we turn our cattle into our crop on our crop ground that normally gives us corn and beans? Um, and that's where um, Cindy asked me to kind of talk about grazing off of pasture. Um, so finding the cover crops, annual forages, crop residues, um, to maybe turn that, um, keep the ground active. We don't necessarily need it to let it go dormant, um, but find other options that are going to be more cost effective when we're running that product through a cow. Um, forage growth, you guys probably know this. Obviously, we have our, dealing with our cool season grasses, warm season grasses, legumes, um, brassicas, those types of things. Um, we want to have diversity in our mixes, as we've talked about today. Um, so they'll all provide different attributes and nutrients to the soil as well as to the cattle that we're going to graze on. Usually our summer slump is when we're looking for forage. Um, this unfortunately started in June last year rather than um, July, August, September like we're normally used to it. So um, if this summer slump comes earlier than normal, what can we do to fill that in? Um, in a non-normal cycle, and that's where our cover crops, our annual forages go right along with those, um, and then our crop, crop residues, which are probably one of the most underutilized resources um, that we have across the country, mainly because of fencing and water restrictions. So starting off um, with any of those forages that I'll get to here in a little bit, um, we have our yield versus quality. Um, conundrum kind of so if we um, have our grasses types that we're going to look for these are going to be your better fiber sources uh, fiber um, grasses for gain is what I like to say so if you're really focused on maybe getting gain on some stalker cattle some backgrounder calves for example um, grass is going to be your best friend in order to get some pounds of gain on those um, but they're going to be a little lower in protein um, cattle don't need a ton of protein, but they need some in order to keep the rumen happy. We have to have at least 7 to 8% protein in our rations at all times. Um, the legumes, brassica, broadleaf options, those are going to be higher in protein, higher in digestibility, um, but less fiber in those. So maybe run right through them a little bit faster. Um, so this is where our maturity um, flip-flop goes. So if we have our... Uh, Relative quality down here, um, we're going to have really um, young growing plants with really high crude protein. As soon as those plants continue maturing, obviously you're going to be less digestible with more stems, fiber in that plant. Um, so usually if we can hit right in the middle, um, it's kind of the sweet spot of where we want to go when we're harvesting, either grazing or mechanically harvesting. One other thing I want to point out is the mineral content of these plants also goes down too. Um, so we had obviously a drought last year. Um, some of those forages and that we stored, you know, we're usually lacking vitamin A and vitamin E in stored forages anyways. Um, or some of our other, other minerals might have been more affected last year also. So always make sure you have a good mineral plan um, with your livestock no matter what program you're in. Um, minerals crisscross every which way with reproduction, nutrition, health, and so on. So cover crops. Um, usually, traditionally, these started right after small grains. So our wheat, we'll drill right into those, um, or silage harvest. They've started interseeding into standing corn. Um, we did a project down at the Southeast Research Farm in Beersford um, this last year where they rented the interseeder, I believe, from Huron District Conservation. Um, and that was pretty cool to see how they went in um, and put that in between the corn rows. Um, the strategy there was to pick varieties that are more shade tolerant. Um, and so they set in the ground, they plant their, or get their roots growing, and then they wait, 
essentially until that corn was gone and then they kind of took off and were ready to go. I haven't seen yield results on that yet. They did, they did pretty good, I think, based on the varieties that they chose. So um, that is the inner seeder that's available, I think, for producers to rent too, if you want to look into that option. Um, research on other states have looked at aerial seeding a little bit. Um, the difficulty with that is the soil seed contact. Um, so they're having, you have to increase your pounds per acre quite a bit um, in order to get a good stand for those. Um, but those are some options too if you don't have a small grain, for example, to follow um, with cover crops. Um, like I said, we want to fill out that summer slump. Um, we can do season long grazing, like Doug was talking about. Um, maybe sacrifice a crop, piece of crop ground acre, start small, as Kay was just saying. Maybe start with one piece, make a season long cover crop, see how it works. Um, put it into your, rot your rotation if that works. Um, we've also done a research project with some producers across the state um, where they have been working oats, for example, into their rotation with corn and soybeans. And then every fourth year there's that cover crop for um, the soil health benefits as well as the cattle benefits for that too. When we're picking our cover crop varieties, we want to optimize growing degree days. So based on the forage growing map I showed you, um, if you're doing a warm season, cool season, um, you can also make choices on low versus high residue options. So rye, for example, be a higher residue. Um, turnips, radishes, be a little bit of a lower residue option there. Um, and then if you're choosing them for supplemental grazing and hay, you're probably going to want to go with the higher forage or higher fiber, higher grass variety or mixes in the cocktails, um, and maybe less, um, less of the broad leaves if you're going to put it up for stored hay. Um, determining your grazing plan for cover crops or annual forages kind of starts like we graze pasture. So we want to have a plan before going into that. Um, if we're doing spring grazing, we really got to pay attention to, um, you know, the, the, when it starts getting warm, obviously, when that plant really starts actively growing, because if it gets too far ahead of us, um, past that boot stage, our quality is going to go down relatively fast. Um, as soon as it shoots that seed head, it'll be hard. Um, the maturity and the protein is going to continue to go down, not entirely um, making it useless. Um, just kind of depends on if you want quality or yield um, as your goal. For spring grazing, we have their winter hardy species. Um, we can have the two options of harvesting either mechanically putting up for hay, um, grazing those options. Um, when we're grazing in the spring, obviously we usually have snow on the ground and so compaction can be more of a worry as the ground starts to thaw. Um, I have some research later showing um, some differences in the compaction that was just reported from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Um, one way to alleviate any kind of compaction if you are seeing an issue, if you have the ability to move your mineral or move your water tank, that can make the cows go a different route every day also. So here's some cool season options. Obviously, um, oats we would plant in the spring, rye, winter wheat, triticale, we can seed in the fall. Um, here's an example of what my family did this last year. So we planted some winter wheat just on 30 acres right by our house, um, and we divided it into four paddocks when we went to go graze that. Um, we started um, on paddock one, obviously. Um, it only lasted about three days. Moved to paddock two, that lasted about six days. Three, it rained, actually. That was the last time it actually rained um, was in paddock three, so we didn't get very good regrowth on that. Um, and by the time we got to paddock four, which is about day 15, um, it was getting a little bit too mature for us. Um, so that's something else to keep in mind if you are rotational grazing your some of um, these forages is to watch the maturity. So we probably should have moved faster from three to four um, because the regrowth we got on four was pretty minimal um, and it was getting so sticky at that time um, for the cows to graze it. Um, but all in all, we had 35 acres grazed um, like 180 head for 22 days, I believe. Came out to about 119 AUMs um, or three and a half uh, AUMs per acre on that. Um, so we went on on May 5th, I believe. So my husband graduated vet school on May 4th. We came home and moved cows on cover crop on May 5th. Um, and then we didn't go to, then we went to a cool season pasture just right to the east there. Um, let one and two regrow, took the fence down and turned them all back out to regraze for a couple more days before we moved down the road. But if we wouldn't have had this um, planted last year, our pastures would have went extremely fast. Um, Brill County was at least D3 last year where I live, um, so 
Just one example that it really worked out for us. Granted, we have cool season pastures that we could have went to, um, you know, and snipped off the top, kept it in a veg vegetative state. Um, but this, we calved, we we're, weren't done calving at this time quite yet either. Um, so this was right off of our calving pasture. So let the mama cows go out and graze that, and the calves didn't have too far to go. Um, so relatively small area that worked pretty good and to get us um, 20 less days on our pasture this last year. Um, granted, for tonnage wise, you know, winter wheat probably isn't the best option for tons. If you want to do triticale, something like that, rye, for example, um, you're going to get maybe more tons of dry matter per acre. Um, but protein content on any of those is very, very good. Um, probably too much almost to meet the requirements. It's way over requirements for beef cattle. Uh, beef cattle requirements during lactation are about 13% protein. Um, most of our cover crops range from 18 to 22 percent protein so that's plenty um, but actually that's what my research was on in grad school is overfeeding protein to dairy cattle is bad right um, we've heard lots of research on dairy cattle side that if you feed too much protein fertility goes way down um, we're not seeing that in the beef cattle side so not a huge worry on feeding too much protein to beef cattle as long as they're adapted to it over you know at least a week time frame before breeding season would start for example um, you should be fine um, summer warm season forages um, has some good examples um, in Doug's pictures, um, sedan grass, sorghum, millet varieties. These are going to be your tonnage options. Um, I think Dan said what you had 8,000 pounds of dry matter per acre um, in his variety. So um, you can get a lot uh, more tons of feed on these options, especially in the summertime. One thing to watch out for on these, as you probably know, are most of them are nitrate accumulators. Um, so if you do fertilize a lot or have a lot of nitrogen, they can soak up those. Um, usually if we strip graze these types of forages, you can limit intake um, and not have to worry so much about getting too much nitrates into them, um, but just something to keep in mind, especially on um, the sorghum options. Um, if you don't want to graze them, or let's say we do get a bunch of rain and we want to hay or chop those um, forages for silage, um, you can certainly do that. Um, just kind of need to make your decision um, early because if you're going to graze it, you're going to want to harvest, obviously start grazing a little bit sooner than you want to chop it for silage, mainly because our moisture is our storage issue with silage. We want that to be 35% dry matter, about, so 65% moisture, um, which is still pretty wet, but um, usually when we see, like even last year when we started chopping corn for silage. It looked dry, but actually the plant was still pretty wet um, because those ears were immature, right? So they weren't as dry as maybe the leaves were dry, but the entire plant was still pretty wet. Um, so an easy way to do that, um, we have some moisture testers across the state in our county offices and regional offices, um, or just chop it, lay it. Um, you can turn your oven on really low, dry it out, weigh it until it, st until it loses, stops losing weight, um, and then take, take your starting weight minus your ending weight, and you can find your moisture content on that. Um, so you can go moisture, but also um, flag leaf to dough stage is when you would want to um, start harvesting that and usually a compromise at the boot stage because uh, it seems like we drive up at that flag, we come back, it's uh, at dough. So usually try to, try to compromise at the boot stage for, for silage harvest. Um, and then try to always cover your silage piles if possible. Um, the first four inches of a bale or a silage you know, equates to about 40% of the total bale or total silage pile. Um, so you can lose a lot of um, forage product there without covering it. Um, usually you can hire an FFA team or club or something, get some kids to come and run that tarp over top, um, put the tires down on it just to keep that oxygen out because the fermentation process um, doesn't want oxygen in there. So um, the better we can do storing our forage, especially last year um, when we needed all the forage we can get come this time of year when there's nothing left out there, um, the better we can be. Um, and lastly, fall grazing for cover crops. Um, usually you want your fast growing species because your growing degree days are getting shorter. Um, winter kill varieties um, if, are, can be nice because then you don't have to worry about spraying them out in the spring. Um, and then usually our ground is hopefully frozen by then. And so there should be minimal compaction risks. 
um, with fall grazing. Um, here's a study done by Iowa State that was just done this last fall. Um, they took, uh, so we talked about pastures that maybe are um, getting in invaded with um, like brome, for example, or they had a Kentucky bluegrass pasture out there um, that they wanted to start over. So they terminated that pasture um, and interceded radishes, turnips, and oats into that. 17 acres is all right by their farm. Um, it equated to about 24% crude protein um, when they did a nutrient test on that. Um, they took 17 fall pears out and strip grazed um, these cover crops and they offered them some corn stalk bales at the same time because um, the moisture content was so high um, in that cover crop variety. Um, it lasted 38 days when they started grazing on November 14th um, and they had a killing frost on November 13th. So Where was that at? this was at Ames, Iowa, about six hours southwest of um, my house, I guess. So about ten, six, eight hours from here. Um, results, what they found, so these are lactating beef cows, just keep in mind. Um, cows lost about a third of a pound per day in both treatments. So I guess I should mention the other half of the cows were in a dry lot situation. So they were comparing grazing a cover crop to a traditional fall dry lot situation. Um, both groups of cows lost 0.3 pounds, which isn't a lot, um, especially when you're lactating, right? So we were able to pretty much meet the lactation requirements of those cows, lose very minimal weight um, in, both, in both situations. For the calves, on the other hand, um, they gained 0.9, almost a pound per head per day on the cover crop compared to the calves in the dry lot. Um, we all know it's hard to have you know, a place in the dry lot for our calves to get a little extra feed rather than just the milk. Um, and to this day, the beef teaching farm manager, so they weaned, and he can still tell which calves he had on the cover crop versus which ones were in the dry lot. Um, so essentially, they ha are going to be about 38 pounds more um, at weaning time, or they were 38 pounds more um, when they came back into the lot. Um, so this is just a sh little example. I know we don't have a ton of research on pears on cover crop, and so that's kind of why I wanted to throw this out there, um, is that it's this, these cover crops are providing more than enough nutrients for our, beef, our mature cows. Um, if we can get young calves on there at their side, um, and then they can learn grazing behavior too, um, that can be as money savings in terms of weaning them early and putting them in a dry lot with stored feed too. Um, so year-round grazing, Doug already talked about this a little bit. Um, so obviously we'd want to plant one in the spring, summer, and fall. Um, example planting dates, I said I'm not an agronomist, so we'll divert to Jason, I believe, for that. Um, so April 1st, June 1st, example, you could do a ryegrass, oats, brassicas, um, radish, and turnips. Um, summer, we would do more of the millet, sorghum, sedan grass varieties. Um, you can throw the turnip radishes in there too um, for that diversity. Um, and then fall, you can do oats, peas, bets, radish, for example. Um, this last year, like I was saying, we did a research project. I was kind of worried about some of the producers not planting it because um, it was so dry. Um, but all of them did. And some of the other producers who I've talked to who didn't said they wish they would have. Um, it's very low input on seed costs. Um, you know, just plant it August 1st or as soon as you can right after you get your weed out. Um, it needs very little rain um, to germinate and get something um, to keep that ground actively growing. One comment on that last slide there, that radish on the spring, April 1st to June 1st. Be very careful on the radish variety because most will just bolt and flower. Okay. Thank you. Um, example of a cover crop mix, you know, so seed cost is going to be, I just put on average, a 25 for an oats turnip pea mix. Um, obviously you want to charge, or here I'm calculating planting charges, depending on if you're doing it yourself, you should still charge yourself something, technically, right? Um, fertilizer, some people do, some people don't. Um, fertilize, it kind of depends on the um, previous crop, I would say. Um, so on, for an example here, I have just 67, almost $70 an acre. Um, if I got 2,000 pounds of dry matter per acre, um, which isn't very much compared to like a summer cover crop, um, that would have a lot more tonnage. If I do an example of 70% grazing efficiency, um, Doug said cows eat 3% of their body weight per day. It's going to give me about 30 pounds of dry matter per day on a 1,350-pound cow, um, which would give me about 47 grazing days per head per acre on this cover crop mix, for example. 
If I equate that um, to about $1.43 per head per day for this cost, for example, um, if I was feeding them $125 per ton hay, that'd be $1.80 a day. So a little bit more input, um, or I mean, in terms of running your tractor over to plant the seed, um, putting some fence up, maybe some water to move your cows out there, um, but you're not delivering hay every single day um, like you would potentially be in a dry lot situation with just hay. Challenges with cover crops, we know they're weather dependent. Um, so like I said, it was, even though it was dry, we still did pretty good with cover crops this last year. Um, late summer moisture, um, if you just catch a little bit, that usually goes a long ways. Um, we're still struggling with establishment in corn and beans, um, but we're getting there. Um, herbicide restrictions, um, there's not, not all herbicides are labeled for grazing. So you need to make sure you're looking at that or you're putting on for your previous crop. If it's not, if it doesn't say grazing on there, it's in the all other category. So it means it's, it's probably might not kill them, I guess you could say. Um, but there's, the research hasn't been done on it, so they don't know. So I don't know if, I'd, um, if you'd want to take that risk, but visit with your um, agronomist um, and hopefully be able to find an option that works for you to graze afterwards. Um, water and fence is always an issue with cover crops. Um, moisture content, it, they are so wet, so providing either corn stock bales, um, something dry available for them. Um, you'll be surprised if you put a cover crop field next to some corn residue, they will go back and forth because they need that dry matter content. They can't physically eat enough of cover crops every day um, to fill, fill their for their energy needs, so they may lose weight on them if you don't have some extra dry forage or even just grass along the fence lines that you can't plant anyways, um, they'll nibble on those. Toxins, nitrates, pur prusic acid, we mentioned with um, sedan grass um, would be something to watch out for towards freezing. Um, sulfur, we've had some selenium issues too, so depending on your soil types, if you know you have some mineral toxicities potentially, um, some of these brassicas or a lot of these cover crops will take up those extra minerals. Um, so limiting may have to happen if you have some of those. Um, a nitrate or a nutri nutrient test for any kind of forage can run about $15 or to $35. Um, not very expensive just to kind of know what you're, what you're feeding. Uh, next, crop residue, um, like I said, one of the most underutilized options. Usually we see the corn stalks blowing into the ditches. Um, pretty hard to bale it up in the ditch once it's there. Um, but cattle are selective grazers. So we talked about the chocolate pudding plants. If you have down corn, they're going to go to the corn first. Then they're going to go to the leaves, the husks, cobs, and stalks. So usually um, we, we can turn them, obviously, out on a complete field of crop residue. Um, but options to strip graze those would be beneficial because that keeps a more uniform diet, makes them eat the corn, the husk um, all together. They're not normally going to eat the stock. We usually don't want to make them do that either. Um, but they're going to selective graze. Um, if you try to limit it to 10 pounds, um, 10 pounds of corn per head, um, 10 to 30, um, we had a lot of down corn this last year. I know Nebraska had a ton of down corn. Um, so they say they said that if they kept it um, 10 bushels or more, if there's 10 bushels or more in the ground, they just really strip grazed it and watched for, for acidosis. Um, but hopefully um, there'll be enough of the other dry matter on there too um, that if you do limit access, they can try to alleviate those bloat risks or um, foundering. Math, simple math, one cow per acre per month. Um, uh, UNL says 15 pounds of residue uh, per bushel of corn that was harvested off that field. Um, we assume 50% consumption because half of it's going to probably blow away or it's going to be trampled on the ground. Um, it's giving you um, 120 bushel corn, for example, 1,800 pounds available. Divided by two is 900 pounds uh, for consumption. If she's going to eat 2% of her body weight, um, this gives me one acre, 90 pounds, divided by 30 pounds per day, 30 days. Okay, so that's how we did that, pretty simple math. But um, if you have higher yields, obviously you're going to be able to probably have some more residue available and stay out there longer. Um, if you pay by the acre or pay by the head, um, sometimes if you have an open winter, paying by the acre is going to be better off for you. Um, excuse me, paying by the acre or paying by the day. So if you're going to pay by the acre, you might be able to take more residue off of there. Um, but if you have an agreement to pay by the day, um, 
you want to maybe increase your stocking numbers um, to utilize the residue for that time frame. Um, here's the UNL just came out with their beef report. Um, they did a three-year study where they looked at grazing, baling, or just leaving all the residue on a cornfield. Um, they took 50% removal on all of those treatments, and they saw no difference in corn yields the next year, all in that 230 range. Um, they did see grazing benefit of the soybean corn rotation, um, and they suggested weighing your bales when you take them off if you are baling. So that kind of gives you an idea of the nutrients to put back on that field. Um, compaction, we've talked about this a little bit as an issue that we're always concerned about. Um, they measure compaction with bulk density, measuring um, the amount of um, soil versus air properties. Um, they did a 16-year study on a 90-acre irrigated plot um, where it's the corn-soybean rotation. They implemented fall grazing, spring grazing, or no grazing at all. Um, and they stocked it at 1.8 to 2.5 AUMs of stalker cattle. Um, what they found was fall grazing increased corn soybean yields, spring grazing increased the soybean yields, and wasn't negatively affecting corn yields, bulk density, or um, stability. The cone index, um, which would kind of be measuring the compaction, um, increased a little bit, but it was still below the threshold that they were worried about. Okay. So just a little bit of a pretty big study. I know it's only on a few acres, um, but it was repeated year after year and didn't see some negative effects. Um, they also did a survey of crop consultants um, recommending grazing on acres. Um, and you know, most of the people that didn't allow grazing on their acres or crop consultants that didn't recommend it um, was because of fencing issues you know, or the amounts that they were wanted to get paid per acre for those residues. So most people are open to grazing as long as you can find a way to put up the fence, um, keep the mineral um, moving around the pasture to limit some compaction pot potential options. Okay, so nutrient analysis. Um, at the end of the day, I've been saying that you know mature cows, um, they can they don't need all the nutrients that's in the cover crops at all the time. It's not going to hurt them, um, but we're going to put some extra body weight on them for sure if we have ample nutrients available. So just comparing a cover crop nutrient analysis, um, like I said, pretty wet. It's so about 80% moisture, um, TDN of 70%. Um, if we go over to the crude protein differences between cover crop, corn stalks, brome, hay, and pasture, um, this corn stalks is about 6%, which they can be all the way down to 3%. Um, you know, we need 7% protein in the ration per day. So on the corn stalk option, you might need some protein supplement no matter what you're, um, you're grazing just to keep the protein happy. But everything else uh, meets protein requirements um, and TDN requirements. Brome hay might be a little bit low, but um, usually they can consume more hay than they need to and be just fine. Um, price comparison between those corn stalks, if we consider labor, water, for example, it might cost us a dollar per head. Um, so cover crops is going to be your cheapest option here, um, but remember that we probably need to supplement some dry forage along with that. Brome hay, a um, dollar eighty, and then pasture around me is still a dollar seventy-five to two bucks a day if you consider everything you're putting into it. Um, so just some co cost comparison options. Make sure you take into account your labor, um, facility equipment options on those. Um, but all mid-gestation spring calving cows can get along just fine on corn stalks with a little bit of a protein supplement and be fine. Um, they can really put on some weight on cover crops. So all are good, um, utilize them all to your advantage. Um, why it matters for me, um, I do a lot of breeding projects or reproduction. Um, we know that reproduction is the leading cost of profit profitability on the beef operation. So we have to get the cows bred, have to calve them, and have to wean their calf, right? Um, so that's why no matter what you're planting, um, we want to consider obviously our soil health. Um, keep that soil active at all time. Keep the cows grazing as long as we can. Um, assess body condition at several times throughout the year, um, if possible. How many of you guys body condition score your cows? So very few, right? So we want, this is the easiest way we can assess the energy reserves of cattle. So we said he looked at the left side of his cow and he was like, ooh, she's pretty good. Looked at the right side. Oh, maybe needs a little bit of feed. Well, we can look at their, over their top line and their brisket um, from behind. Um, see the, how they're carrying their condition, um, and especially at weaning time. You know, if they wean that, go to weaning and they're a little bit thin, 
Um, we can take that time when they're not lactating anymore to put some weight on before calving season, um, and we can maintain her after calving to breeding. If we're gonna try to put weight on from calving to breeding, it's gonna cost us a lot more money, okay? Because she's lactating and she's gonna put everything she has into her milk. We want cows at a body condition score of about five and a half, um, heifers at a six at calving time. And we should be good to go. If we're overfeeding, um, it's gonna cost us too much money um, and not necessarily give us too much of a benefit. Here's some references of where you would look at for condition um, in order to assess where they're at. In cows, we have a one to nine scale. We wanna shoot for this five to six range. You should see about two to three ribs if they're in a five. Um, if you see more than three ribs, they're getting on that four side. Um, if you see no ribs, they're up in the seven range. This matters to pregnancy rate because we have to get them to resume cycling like we talked about within 80 days in order to maintain a 365 day calving interval. So if we shoot for, a, if we're in a four, we're only gonna potentially get 50% of those cows bred um, because they're not gonna be cycling effectively. If we're in this five and six range, we get from 80 to 98%, and that's right where we wanna be. Um, if we are gonna be a little bit low, we're gonna have some dropout. Um, you know, this last year was tough on us for cows, um, but we saw a lot of cows move, and maybe they were our problem cows. You know, maybe they struggled to put weight on, maybe they didn't wean the large, biggest calf that we needed. Um, you know, it's okay to see those ones go sometimes. Um, if, we, if we need to find a good side of the drought, that's what our good side was. So got rid of our problem cows potentially. Um, this year, hopefully we're left with some good breeding back potential. Um, they'll resume estrus sooner. Um, hopefully have more calves for us to wean or calve this spring um, and larger calves come weaning time. So that's about all I have um, for the grazing cover crop side of it. Economically, like I said, the more times we can keep them out of the dry lot, it's usually, usually gonna be more cost effective for us. Um, we can rest pastures. You see an improved livestock performance on some of the cover crop studies we've done. We've saw up to three and a half, four pounds of gain um, in young calves. So those are options too, rather than, than just corn like we normally would put through them. Um, manure value would be something to consider. Um, take some soil samples to assess what you're, if you are grazing, what value that's adding to your crops. I mean, hopefully with good management, we'll have improved or better um, or maintained crop yields from year to year. So um, th with that, here's my contact information. I am in Mitchell, um, but I'll travel across the whole state. Um, and with that, I'll try to answer any questions you guys may have.